you. It's really good to be here, and uh, uh, and uh, thank you for inviting me. And, and clearly, some of the work, a lot of the work we do is about collecting 3D data or time-resolved 3D data. So it's very opposite to come to today's meeting, which is about using that data and developing models and understanding. Um, I often end up giving talks that I'll kind of, I'll say, just cover a lot of topics. Uh, it's really nice to come today and, and actually try and concentrate on just one topic, um, which is the, is looking at composite materials failure. Um, of course, composites are complex and multi, uh, multi uh, phase materials. And, and I'm sure you, you, know, you don't really need me to tell you what X, how X-ray imaging works. But of course, the great thing about X-ray imaging is that you create a radiograph, that radiograph is put together with many other radiographs to create a 3D, well, once it's reconstructed, a 3D image. But the key point about that is because it's non-destructive, it gives us that opportunity to go back again and take another image and another image and another image. So we can, we can collect time, either time resolved images in real time or time lapse images over many weeks or many months. So we can really understand not just how, you know, we can not just understand 3D structure at the beginning, but we can understand how 3D structure evolves over time. I just want to show just two quick examples of that. And so the 3D nature, this work, this work we did, uh, Fabian Leonard did this in, in Manchester a little while ago, looking at, um, looking at uh, an impact on a composite plate. But of course, the nice thing about that is that once you've got that 3D data, uh, you can cut it up and you can, uh, I mean, the quality of the image isn't as good as it was on the screen. <laughs> Never mind. Um, but you, you can, you can uh, once you've got the image, you can, uh, you can slice it, you can analyze it, you can separate the phases, you can understand the nature of the cracking and so forth. And in this case, uh, by uh, segmenting the image in a particular way, you can separate out the damage layer by layer. So you can see how different layups and different um, fiber layups give rise to, to different uh, types of damage uh, and, and which, which uh, interfaces are, are most likely to damage. And as I said, the other point is that you can measure over time. This is a woven composite, so it has a kind of unit cell. And in that unit cell, we can, we can, we can collect the information across the whole, the whole piece, but we can also uh, look at that particular unit cell and understand the damage that it shows in this. So in this case, we have a weft, uh, a warp and a weft. We have uh, uh, fatigue loading. And of course, uh, as is the case for many composites, were we to say, well, composite should be used in an undamaged state, we would massively reduce the lifetime of composite materials. Just in the same way, I mean, I remember when I was, when, much, when I was uh, talking maybe many years ago, we talked about um, aircraft flight and, 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 and the river ponds. In, a, in an aircraft, you have about 100,000 rivets, and you probably have 10% of those have cracks. So that means you're flying in an aircraft with around 10,000 cracks. And it's important that we understand how those cracks behave. Well, it's analogous in a composite material. A composite material will always have cracks, uh, or at least uh, as soon as it starts to be used, in, probably even for manufacture. So here we can see a, a, just a unit cell taken from that woven structure. And we can see the, uh, we've basically taken away the matrix, so you can just see the fibers and you can just see the, the damage. And it's fairly damage free in the, in, in the as, as made case. But within a thousand cycles, you can see transverse ply cracks starting to occur. And those uh, tend, to, tend to occur normal to the applied load. And as we go on, the periodicity between those increases, uh, their, length, their size increases. Uh, we start to get uh, cracks running um, uh, parallel to the plies, um, and uh, obviously uh, by the time we get to 50,000 cycles, we can see a significant increase in the number uh, of cracks and defects. Uh, by 60,000 cycles, those are all starting to really connect up. Uh, by 70,000, we, we can see they're going further. And at 80,000 cycles, which is just before failure, so this is uh, this is 80 times after we saw those first cracks in that first 1,000 cycles, uh, we can see that uh, uh, the damage is really quite extensive and failure takes place soon after. So I think in engineering materials, we tend to need to understand damage. We need to make materials that are damage tolerant, and we need to have models that tell us how that damage will occur. 
and, and how that damage will progress. Of course, what that enables us to do then is to identify non-destructive testing procedures that will allow us to interrogate this material. If we know that uh, cracks are going to grow at a certain rate, we can calculate the period between which we need to make inspections, and that enables us to assure the safe life of a, a component, whether that's a nuclear component or an aero engine component or, or, or uh, something less uh, structurally critical. So understanding damage, how it, where it initiates so that we know where to look for it, how quickly it grows so we know how often to look, look for it is really critical. And modeling is now an integral part of many safety cases. If you want to build a nuclear plant today, you may not be able to undertake enough tests over enough time to make an assurance. What you need to do is combine modeling and measurement in order to uh, put those two things together. And we often talk about the term digital twin. I actually like to think of that. We often forget the poor other twin. So we talk about the digital twin, but we also need to remember the physical twin. And obviously in the long term, we hope that the physical twin will kind of become less important. But today, the physical twin is really important because it helps us to validate and test and extend our models and increase our assuredness of our predictions. So, you know, please, when you use the word digital twin, please bear in mind that physical twin. And how do we collect that data? How do we validate this data? How do we bring modeling and measurement together? And I think that's a really, really important message to get across. Uh, I read a lot of uh, EPSRC research proposals where we talk about doing everything in the virtual sphere. And maybe, maybe one day that will happen. But my suspicion is we will always need some experiments uh, to complement and to assure our modeling capability. And, uh, and, and then indeed, that's a good engineering approach. Okay, so if we, if we start to think about image-based modeling, um, we, need to, we, we need to be able to collect good data in order to uh, put that into, into a, 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 a computer model. And I'm not going to go through this in any detail because I presume I wasn't, unfortunately, I couldn't be here yesterday, but, but presume this has been done and gone through many times before. The idea that you scan your material in 3D, you can then mesh that, and you can then either, I mean, in many cases, I remember we, we did an experiment for a French group, a PhD student came over in the vacation, so we need really, really high resolution data. We want all this data. So we took all these scans, and we meshed all these scans together, and we built this huge database, a huge image volume of concrete material. And they said, oh, this is too big for us. So they then, uh, they then downsampled that and, and took a much smaller model. So, so, but, but inevitably, what we want to be able to do is to collect data at different length scales to build multi-scale models and to put those together. But this is actually a, a, was a piece of work we did maybe, uh, maybe eight or nine years ago. And I was, I was quite surprised just how many people have cited this paper, which is a relatively simple paper, just looking at, at a 3D measurement, creating a 2D model, and then... Uh, looking at the cracking behavior. I think, you know, we, we uh, Queen and I talked before the, uh, before the session about the need to store that data, because at that time, the modeling capability could really only do 2D modeling. Now, they took individual slices and they turned those into a number of 2D models, but obviously that data has a, has a, has a longer lasting value because techniques and methods improve. And I think, you know, one of the things we really need to think about as we move forward is how do we make 3D or possibly 4D or even more than 4D data available to users because modelers need that data and different modelers might need different aspects of that data. And at the moment, we, we find it, you know, people are very good. Oh, yeah, you can store your data on our database. And then you tell them the size of your data set and you all have a bit of a think about it. And it can be difficult transporting it. Uh, it can be difficult storing it, and it can be difficult accessing and analyzing it. And this is work we really need to think of as we go forward and make the case for data stores that allow us to do that. So composites have a lot of um, different length scales. Obviously, if you're building wind turbine, that length scale could be two, could be 100 meters. Um, we're now looking at, 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 at wind turbine blades that are 100 meters or so. So really significant pieces of uh, 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 engineering. But we need to understand that at, at, at its functional level. We need to understand the stresses that are, uh, that are delivered. We need to understand the fatigue cycling experiences. We need to understand the environment it, it, it experiences. 
but clearly we need to then understand that at the at the laminate level or the uh, and then we need to understand that at the uh, at the uh, intralaminar level and we need to be able to understand it then at the fiber level so we can understand interface failure and so forth and clearly we need to be able to understand it even at the atomic level in terms of the optimization of fiber technology and so forth. So that's a big challenge for modeling and big challenge for measurement. So um, I'm just going to give you one example of a piece of work we've done. Uh, we did uh, with, with uh, in fact, Rice and Senku was the, was the postdoc who did the work. And the aim was to look at a piece of notched uh, multiply composite. So relatively simple piece of work. In fact, we actually did this work about 10 years earlier for the for the American uh, uh, the American uh, uh, American Navy because they wanted to understand the, the, the nature of damage around a, a notch in, in a multiply composite. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming quite a bit of work has been focused on, 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 on uh, the image acquisition process. Here we went to a diamond light source. Uh, the great thing about diamond light source is we have higher intensity, so we can do time-lapse experiments at shorter times than we can do in the lab. Um, and we, we basically fatigue, we basically uh, loaded a, a, a sample. In this case, it wasn't fatigue, it was just a simple loading case. And we recorded a series of images. I don't know whether that is that. Yes. So we recorded a series of images, one before we uh, really applied much load, just enough load to hold the sample. And then we took a number of images. You can see we unloaded took the images here, at these points B, C, D, and E, as we, uh, as we loaded the sample and the, and the response of that sample uh, deteriorated with damage and we because uh, we wanted to look at the at the fiber level we actually had only looked at a small volume of this material you can see just around that notch where the damage was likely to take place and the sample was about four millimeters so this was about two 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 millimeters in diameter and that allowed us to image that those fibers at sort of micron scale so we could see the six micron carbon fibers so um, this kind of just explains the modeling strategy. Again, I'm sure, it, I don't think it's particularly novel. Um, we took the X-ray CT of our volume. So this is the, this little volume of interest is shown on the, on, on the, on the left here. And um, from that, we could extract fiber orientations for the different plies. We were able to create models of each fiber, and then we were able to apply some boundary conditions, work out all the failure mechanisms that could occur, we could then put those together into plies. We could then put those plies together into the composite. And we tried to validate that with the X-ray CT that we measured as a function of time. So that was the kind of approach we took. And what I'm going to do is just talk you through some of the, some of the steps in that and, and have a look at, at some of the answers. So um, one, of the, one of the things to note, of course, here is that some of that is stochastic. Some of it is deterministic. So. Um, Fiber failure, for example, each fiber will fail stochastically. So you've got to think about not just having deterministic models based on me mechanical tests, but you also need stochastic models which say, well, what is the chance of a fiber fracturing? So at the, at the subscale, at the fiber level, we had a stochastic model. As we went further up, we ended up with uh, more deterministic type models from basic tests. Okay. So, yeah, so as I said, the strategy was to take that volume of interest, which is, as you can see, comprises 45 uh, degree plies, 90 degree plies, minus 45 degree plies, and naught degree plies. So the naught degree is parallel to the applied load. And as I said, we were able to extract small volumes from each area to build up little, uh, little um, uh, areas of, of, to understand the effect of, of fiber alignment and so forth. Uh, and of course, in reality, life is more complicated than, than that because you're, you're far, you're often it's very difficult to get enough uh, enough contrast. So you can see here we, we've got some phase contrast. Um, that phase contrast helps us by helping making it slightly easier to see some of these cracks. Um, but it also makes the images a little bit difficult to interpret. We took two and a half, rough, roughly, uh, uh, roughly 2,000 uh, slices, uh, two and a half thousand pixels, roughly. 32-bit images, um, 30, 300 nanometers a pixel, um, and as I said, a little bit of phase contrast to try and extract the features. And you can see there are interplied delaminations, there are cross-ply, transverse ply cracks, there are 
cracks that pass from one ply to another, and there are fiber fractures if you look very carefully. So in order to uh, extract all the information, one of the things we wanted to do was to be able to track individual fibers, because obviously you could model every fiber, it's perfectly aligned, every fiber perfectly distributed in a nice, simple way. But in reality, a manufacturing means that fibers aren't perfectly aligned. So what we did was we tried to track every fiber. So in, instead of using just a, a kind of um, simple thresholding type method, uh, basically we tried to identify each fiber in every slice. So you, you identify the fibers in that slice, you take the next slice, you try and find the same fibers, you try and find their centers and you track them through all those slices. Of course, it's not easy when the images aren't very good. Uh, we can actually do better than these images, but you can just see in this case, this was taken a, a few couple of years ago, but a few years ago, but you can see the images are not easy to interpret. They don't look like nice, simple fibers. So it, it's actually quite a challenge to make sure that you can track as many of those fibers as you can through your sampling volume. And because we wanted to, in this case, we wanted to see both the individual fibers, but also see the cracks and, 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 the, and the relationship between the plies, we had a, a bit of a challenge in terms of microstructural scales. So um, essentially, so, so essentially, you look for every fiber in the next ply or the next ply. Uh, if you find them, you can create a nice loci uh, of, that, of the fiber trajectory. So the, on, in the red at the bottom are the fiber trajectories that you extract. And so once you've got your fibers for one ply, uh, you, can, you can, well, we did that for each of the plies. So we had four data sets. We had four volumes. We had the naught degree plies, the 90 degree plies, plus 45 and the minus 45s. And for each case, we could create, a, a, create a, little, a little region of interest. So a small volume that represents those fibers. Um, and then we were able to, um, uh, to, to think about how, what is the behavior of those small volumes. So uh, this is, again, the process that we undertook. So we essentially model those fibers by taking the, the, the X-ray rendering, convert that into a, a 3D model, um, and then we can, we can apply a whole series of, uh, I mean, most of these are fairly basic uh, properties. So um, elastic modulus, tensile strength, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then of course, the, the, I think really the challenging thing is, okay, you now have a, you now have a material and you have a unit, if you have a, a kind of a volume of interest, a region of interest, how do you determine all the different types of ways in which that material can fail? So in this case, you've got, um, you've got sliding between the fiber and the matrix. You've got, um, you've got matrix cracking. You've got fiber fractures. And, and of course, the cracks can go in all sorts of different ways. They can go parallel to the fibers. They can go normal to the fibers. And so what we tried to do was to try and establish, if you like, different models uh, for uh, those fractures. And, and the, you can see the, the values here at the bottom. So these values are 0 .6 mi 0 0.06 microns. This just tells you at, at what stage in the displacement profile. So you can see that early on, very early on in the straining pro profile, you start to get sliding and, uh, of the matrix. But you can see that a debonding occurs at about 1.2, matrix cracking occurs at 2.4, and fiber fracture tends to occur quite late on. So you can see the progress of each of these different mechanisms. And of course, if you look at, the, you look at that, you need to understand then how that affects the, the behavior. If you look here carefully, you can see little micro cracks in the resin. You can see um, clearly see fra fractured fibers. You can see transverse cracks. So it's a quite a complex set of uh, failure mechanisms. And the other thing you need to remember, of course, is that the loading isn't uniaxial. If this was uniaxial, it would be easy to have nice simple failure criteria. You need to actually have triaxial or uh, failure criteria. And you need to think about the boundary conditions acting on each of the different regions of interest. So here you can see different types of failure. And, and we, we try to develop uh, different boundary conditions for each of those different, uh, different failure types. And, and you can see here, very simple, uh, very simple failure. So these are, bi you can see these biaxial um, uh, failure maps, if you like. So we're using data to try and predict uh, how the failure in, in different directions. So this is the axial direction. One one is the axial direction. And clearly the failure stress in the axial direction is to be higher failure in the transverse direction. 
but you can see how we, we've tried to take different predictions to try and work out, again, the contrast, unfortunately, doesn't come out very well here. But what you, you should see is these, this is where they were aligned in, uh, uh, in, and you can see the different, the different um, orientations of the, uh, the different orientations of the fibers in, in the sub -bulb. So we were able to identify a number of different failure mechanisms and ascribe different failure loads uh, accordingly. And of course, um, you also need to take into account the composite has different types of uh, inherent defects, if you like. It has fiber free regions, it has misalignments, it has clusters, it has, in some cases, it has some broken clusters. Um, and you need to try and include, include those in, in these kinds of uh, systems. So, a very complex uh, set of different, uh, different damage nucleation and growth mechanisms. I'll yeah, try to, to capture some of that. And uh, then if we, uh, as we go forward, uh, what we're then able to do is to, uh, to put that all together in our multiply model um, and start to say, well, okay, what, what mechanisms are going to happen? At what stage are they going to happen? And where are they going to happen? And uh, so um, what you can see here again, uh, you can see here at different, these are different displacements. You can see that at 14 microns of displacement, you can see that we were starting to, uh, to get some, uh, some ply failures. So you can see these are the, the, um, uh, the this tells you the stresses here. Um, and uh, you can see that we get some 45, plus or minus 45 degree cracks. You can see those starting to come in here. You can see 90 degree ply cracking. So that's that transverse ply cracking that we were talking about. And then ultimately, we get some uh, failure of the longitude requirement. And clearly, all of those might be important. Some of those might be important because they allow, you know, for example, matrix cracks might allow ingress of the environment. So, you know, if you're running a wind turbine, for example, and you get transverse ply cracks and you don't have a sufficient coating, then the environment might get in, you may get ice forming on the surface, the ice will increase the cracking, and you'll get an, a coupling between the transverse ply cracking and uh, ultimate failure. So it's not just the case that the zero degree plies are, are, rate de are failure determining because it, it depends on the environment. But here we can see that clearly, uh, you know, the material will have some residual strength until the naught degree plies start to crack. And once the naught degree plies start to crack, once those fibers start to go, because they're so much stronger than the matrix, and because they bear such a large fraction of the load, uh, they, when, when they go, the, the material basically starts to lose all mechanical integrity. So what this enables us to do is to collect some really, you know, to, to, there's, there's a lot of ways in which modeling like this can go wrong. And what in imaging allows us to do is A, to make sure we get the model set up right in the first place. So the model is, uh, is a representative of the manufactured item. But what it also does is, is you've got to make a lot of decisions between there and, and, and your final predictions. The, you've got to understand the different mechanisms. You have to understand that, that how they behave in, in, in a triaxial stress situation. And so what this enables us to do is to put under the spotlight all of those assumptions. And by collecting x-ray data that then uh, occurs as uh, x-ray data as a function of load, we can actually examine the degree to which different failure mechanisms are kicking in at the right time and under the right loading conditions. So it really enables us to, uh, to shine quite a harsh light on our modeling strategy. And that, of course, enables you to improve your modeling strategy very quickly. So I think this kind of, um, I, I think, uh, you know, we, we uh, again, as I talked at the beginning about a physical twin, and a, a digital twin, uh, I would argue that, you know, when we talk about image-based modeling, don't just think about image-based modeling as using a CT image to set up your model. Think about using CT or other methods uh, as a way of validating that. And, and it's not just X-ray CT, you could be using digital image correlation, for example, to image the cracks that are occurring and understand the, make, the nature of the cracking when the cracking occurs. It could be acoustic emission that you're using to, here are the fiber fractures. And so you can relate the fiber fractures 
to the prediction of the not five bell bracket. It could be that you're using ultrasound and you're, you're and, and, and producing ultrasound maps to correlate with your baby, with your uh, failure predictions. But I think this ability to be able to combine image-based models with uh, in situ or ex situ tests and non-destructive tests is a really valuable way forward. And um, you know, I think you know it's a, it's a it's a it's an important strategy if we're going to develop more robust modeling uh, techniques. And if we're going to also, we obviously it allows us to shine a light on the theories and our understanding. You know, it, it's not just about getting the right constitutive equation. In some cases, it's understanding the mechanisms. Okay, so obviously what we did then was to uh, compare the predictions in two ways. We compared the predictions with the actual loading curve, and you can see that the loading curve, whilst the predictions are not perfect, you can see that the, uh, the, the predictions of the model capture the general um, shape of the curve and actually do remarkably well in terms of relating the displacement to the, to the, uh, the loads that can be borne by the material. So I think you know, that, that's pretty reassuring. And um, whilst, of course, you wouldn't expect a one-to-one -one correlation between, uh, you know, well, you, 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 you'd love to see a one-to-one -one correlation between the cracks that are predicted and the cracks that you measure, what we can do then is we can then quantify those cracks, the, the number of cracks you get in the X-ray CT, and compare that with the number of cracks and the location of those cracks that you're getting in the, uh, in the microstructural model. So I think, you know, this, as an approach, this, this uh, has a great deal of merit. And it was interesting that the student actually published this paper first without the side-by-side -side analysis with the CT, because we hadn't managed to do, complete all that work in the second paper that was published in 2020 actually brings those two into coincidence. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a really important strategy. Okay, so I hope, I, you know, through this talk, I hope I've, I've kind of um, shown a one particular application of image-based modeling and its relationship to X-ray, time resolved X-ray CT. Uh, but I hope on the other, uh, I've brought out some of the, the key aspects about how models relate to measurements, and, and the importance of those measurements, both from a kind of NDT approach to validate the models, but also in terms of the NDT that you might need to um, validate safety cases or to determine inspection routines. So if you're, you know, if you've got a wind turbine, you know, if you've got a wind turbine blowing somewhere off the Shetlands, you don't want to be, you don't want to be inspecting that every five minutes. Um, but on the other hand, you don't want unexpected failures. So uh, balancing that is a really important. So just to conclude, you know, I hope I've shown that X-ray CT, because it can provide this temporal evolution and because it can provide 3D information. So 3D, great for setting up models, temporal evolution, great for testing models. So, um, and, and as I said, in real life, fibers don't go where they want to, where you want them to. Uh, resins don't necessarily infiltrate where you want them to. You get fiber-free regions, you get uh, contacting fibers, you get fibers that cross over, you get fibers that get broken during manufacturing. What this enables us to do is also to say, well, how good does manufacturing have to be? How straight do the fibers need to be? How uh, free of certain defects that this needs to be? How important are voids uh, in, in the resin? Do they, do they play a role or do they not? So it enables us to really examine the degree to which manufacturing has to be uh, be perfect and the degree to which you can accept errors and uh, errors in manufacturing. I think the, the next point is that when you build a model, you really have to understand initiation, growth, and coalescence of damage. And in, in metals, the, that, tech, that, that approach has been developed over 50, 60 years. In composites, there's still quite a few gaps in our understanding. Um, as I said, I would argue that 3D imaging, you know, it, it, we need to be able to create realistic 3D models and we need to know how big is a representative volume is big enough? Uh, how much data do we need? Um, have, we, have we got something that's representative? And I'm sure other people will be looking at that over these two days. But I think how big, how big a data set is big enough? How, much, how many levels of scale do we need to take into account? How do we pass information from one scale to another? All of these things are important and, they, and we need to think about them before we acquire image-based 
data. Then, um, as I said, I think you know the great thing about X-ray CT is it allows us to have that in, in that, that aspect of time, so we can follow something whether that be uh, a, a semi a, a, a semi continuous test, as in this case, or it could be fatigue that could take place over many many uh, months, or it could be environmental effects that might take place over years, or oxidation uh, which takes place over many years, and the ability to be able to take the same sample and move it backwards and forwards, and therefore actually look at in individual defects and understand how individual defects behave, rather than just collect lots of statistical data, uh, it can be really insightful in terms of building models. Um, and as I said, the, 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 the real important thing is then how do we take all this knowledge and apply it, whether that's to the design of future, future build or the design of inspection or existing plant. And I think that's a really important aspect. I just wanted to then, I mean, you mentioned at the beginning, um, we have a, we are lucky in Manchester to have part, we now have a national research facility along with um, Warwick, uh, UCL and Southampton. Uh, we have about 10 different machines. You can access even bigger machines at Southampton. You can access phase contrast machines at UCL. And you can uh, you can image uh, you can access some faster machines at Warwick. So it, you anyone can apply to have some beam time. And if if you're a modeler who's not very confident about doing tests, we can also if you provide the material, we can do the imaging and provide the data for you that you could then turn into an X-ray into a uh, image based model. So please do think about that. You can apply. Uh, you can apply with a very short proposal and can gain access. To some really unique facilities. So, if you if you are um, if you are thinking about uh, about using X-ray CT, uh, please uh, do get in contact with us. Thank you very much. I hope you find it.